is having real impact on people's lives. Dating is a very indestructible demand on a global I basis. I mean, no matter what has happened throughout history, recessions or wars, Pan love even prevails. pandemics, even pandemics, you, love prevails. And you probably so does hooking up and being a 304 it's indestructible hey guys did you hear the bumble ceo say dating is a very indestructible demand on a global basis no matter what has happened throughout history recessions wars love prevails it's a bold statement isn't it it's the company's initial public offering in february 2021 at that time the dating app held a nearly nine billion dollar valuation but at friday's market close Bumble's $13.67 share price was 83% below its all-time high of $78.89, achieved in its first week of trading. The 34-year-old Wolf Herd saw her own fortune tumble as Bumble shares cratered, losing her billionaire status. Bumble's stock slid 9% to about $12.40 in early Monday trading following the news of the CEO transition, trading well below its all-time low closing price of $12.90 set last week. But let's take a moment to unpack this. The CEO seems to be implying that the need for love and connection, the desire to date, is bulletproof. It transcends the ups and downs of life, economies, and global events. But there's a glaring omission in this narrative. You see, the landscape of dating has shifted dramatically. The rise of the digital age has introduced a new player to the game dating apps. And with them, a culture of casual hookups and fleeting connections seems to be outpacing the pursuit of true monogamous love. It's like a race where the hare has taken the lead over the tortoise. We're living in an era where the hookup culture and the allure of being a free spirit are eclipsing the desire for one-to-one, -one, long-term relationships. When a CEO of a dating app cites the indestructible demand for dating, it's important to remember that this demand isn't always driven by a quest for love. Often it's driven by the thrill of the chase, the adrenaline rush of a new encounter, and the convenience of no-strings-attached relationships. The truth is, that dating apps like Bumble have become a playground for hookups and one-night stands. It's been a playground for the Chad and Trionis. And while that serves a purpose for some, it does raise the question of whether love, in its traditional sense, truly prevails in the world of dating apps. Are these platforms facilitating genuine connections, or are they simply fueling the fire of the hookup culture? But the question is, does love truly prevail in the world of dating apps? Bumble's entire premise was about women choosing first, but did it solve any real issue? Let's delve into this. This woman is one of the co-founders of Tinder. She had some type of scandal there, left, created Bumble, which is the dating app that allows women to choose the men, which we already know. It's, it, it's, it's, so stu it's such a stupid premise because women already do that on the apps. Women are choosing the top 10% of men, it went down to five and a study from Tinder actually shows women are swiping right on 1% of men and leaving the rest of the men, average men, even above average men, men who are on their level, even men say the woman is a four or five, the guy can be above her in looks and everything else. But because she was a DNA receptacle for Chad and Tyrone and Thug Roan, then she thinks she's special and she's above the average man. The whole idea behind Bumble was to flip the script, to allow women to take control and make the first move. It was an attempt to challenge the patriarchal norms of dating. But here's the kicker. Women have always had the upper hand in choosing men on dating apps. Consider this. A considerable number of women on these platforms often have the luxury of choosing from the top 20% or even the top 10 or 1% of men on these apps, regardless of their own attractiveness. But here's where it gets interesting. This power dynamic is most evident in hookups and one-night stands, but in most cases, these top-tier men that women choose don't commit to them. So, what happens? They find themselves back on the dating apps, back in the cycle. Now let's consider the men's experience. Many men have stopped using apps like Bumble and Tinder, feeling frustrated and overlooked. Even after shelling out for premium memberships, they see no results. Why? Because the majority of women are drawn to the top 20, 10 or even 1% of men, leaving the remaining 80 to 90% in the dust. And here's the real irony. The top tier men, the ones women are vying for, they probably didn't even pay for a premium membership. They swoop in, engage with these women, and then disappear, 
leaving the women disillusioned and projecting their experiences onto all men. And these overlooked men, they're left feeling unheard and unappreciated, their grievances falling on deaf ears until women start voicing their own displeasure. It seems that for these dating apps the bottom line was more important than human satisfaction. But they overlooked a key factor, men are the primary paying customers on these platforms. They're the ones more likely to feel the need for premium memberships. So, are these apps truly empowering women or just creating a skewed dating landscape? This is a question we need to ponder as we navigate the complex world of online dating. While women get to choose, what about the men on these apps? This question brings us to an often overlooked side of the story. Men, particularly those who don't fall within the top echelon of desirability on these platforms, often find themselves in a state of disillusionment. They're swiping, they're messaging, they're even shelling out for premium memberships, but their efforts seem to yield little to no results. Why, you might ask? The answer lies in the skewed dynamics of these apps. Women, as we've discussed, often go for the top 20, 10, or even 1% of men, leaving a staggering 80 to 90% of men feeling ignored. And the irony? Those top-tier guys probably didn't even have to reach for their wallets to enjoy this attention. But what happens when these ignored men start voicing their concerns? Unfortunately, their frustrations often fall on deaf ears. They've been expressing their dissatisfaction for years, yet it's only when women start complaining, when women start leaving, that the executive teams spring into action. Dear Bumble through sluggish user spending in an industry she said, quote, hasn't seen true innovation in several years. In an attempt to fix that, Bumble announced plans to relaunch its eponymous app and refresh the Premium Plus subscription offering. This comes weeks after Tinder owner Match Group also revealed it was updating its apps to appeal to Gen Z users and women after projecting January to March revenue below estimates. Analysts said these apps were in need of a makeover, but warned revenue growth this year could be slower than Bumble expects as product improvements may take time to gain traction among users. At least eight. Meanwhile, men are have just leaving dating apps. They're not interested anymore because they don't get results because everything, as we know, in the Western world is catered towards women, women only. They only care about what women want, what women feel. Women drive demand. Women are ones that make all the purchases. Women, women, women. And they've left men behind. They forget about men. They don't care what men feel. Men have been complaining about these dating apps for years, but it's only when women complain and leave the apps that now they're in trouble and now they need to retool it. You see how that works? Suddenly, there's talk of restructurings and retoolings, of finding solutions to problems that men have been pointing out for ages. Now, this isn't to say that these companies don't care about their users. However, it does beg the question, are they more interested in the money than in human satisfaction? After all, it's the men who are more likely to feel the need for premium memberships, the men who are more likely to contribute to the financial success of these apps. Yet it seems their needs and concerns are often pushed to the wayside until they align with those of the female users. So, we find ourselves in a situation where men are paying for a service that often leaves them feeling overlooked and unheard. A situation where their concerns are only addressed when they start aligning with the concerns of the women on these platforms. It seems that for these dating apps, it's more about the money than human satisfaction. Is the fall of these dating apps a bad thing, or could it be a blessing in disguise? The decline of these platforms could actually be seen as a positive development. For years, dating apps like Bumble have been selling illusions to men and women alike. Women are led to believe that they can keep pursuing the unattainable Chads and Tyrones, who, in reality, will never commit to them. These apps feed the illusion that one of these men will eventually commit, and if he doesn't, all she has to do is jump back on the app. But let's not forget, if most people were finding long-term committed relationships on these platforms, the apps wouldn't be generating nearly as much revenue. The business model of these apps isn't designed to facilitate true love, it's designed to keep users coming back for more. To keep them swiping, hoping, and most importantly, paying. For men, these apps create the illusion that by paying for a premium membership, they can increase their chances of finding a girlfriend. But let's be honest, it's hard to measure chance in this context. And when the top 20% of men are attracting the majority of female attention, the odds are stacked against the average guy. But imagine a world without these dating apps. Parents could raise the next generation of women with virtues to have dignity and self-respect. 
Men wouldn't feel pressured to pay for a chance at love. People could connect on a deeper level face-to-face -face without the superficiality of swiping left or right based on a few photos and a witty bio. This isn't to say that technology and dating can't mix, but perhaps we need a new approach, one that prioritizes genuine connections over profit. One that encourages us to see each other as humans, not commodities. One that fosters a healthier dating culture where love isn't a game to be won but a journey to be shared. Perhaps the fall of these apps will pave the way for a healthier dating culture. So, what can we do about this? Well, it's clear that there's a lot to unpack. The world of online dating is tricky, and it's high time we started a conversation about it. We've seen how the very structure of these apps can foster a toxic environment. We've discovered how these platforms prioritize profit over genuine human connection. And we've heard the voices of countless individuals who feel ignored, exploited and disillusioned. So, let's talk about it. Let's share our experiences, our thoughts, our questions. Let's challenge the norms that these apps have set by boycotting these apps. Maybe you want to short the stocks of Bumble, not financial advice, just food for thought. Please do your research first before deciding on shorting the stock. Perhaps you've had a different experience with these apps. Maybe you found your significant other on Bumble or Tinder. Or perhaps you're one of the many who feel disillusioned and disappointed by these platforms. Whatever your story is, I want to hear it. And it's a crucial piece of the larger puzzle we're attempting to solve. Don't forget to smash that like button, subscribe with bell notifications, and share this video. Let's continue this important conversation.